Good morning, everyone. What an amazing uh, introduction. I'm kind of like, are they talking about me? That's cool. <laughs> Hi. So yes, my name is Caitlin Southwick. I am the founder and executive director of Key Culture. And I'm here today to talk to you about the S word, sustainability. Um, I have to say that I had I have had some conversations with the Europeana uh, team and talking about you know today's theme is technology, and so I was really racking my brain on okay how like technology and sustainability obviously there's a lot of overlap there obviously there are a lot of issues there and so I started putting my presentation together. And then I came here on Wednesday and went home and threw the entire thing away. So um, I ha I, it's just really amazing to see such an engaged group of people who are not only really passionate about cultural heritage, but really understand this idea of using heritage for the greater good. So during my session today, I want to talk a little bit about this nexus of culture and sustainability, sprinkle some technology on it, but there's a little bit more focus on digital and the opportunities that we have as Europeana. Let's see. I'm going to see if I know how to do this. There we go. That's great. <laughs> All right. So as introduced, um, I'm actually an art conservator by training. Um, this is a picture of me on Rapa Nui working on the Moai statues. And this is another picture of me working on a historical house monument here in the Netherlands. And as you can see, uh, by all of the personal protective equipment that I have to wear all the time, um, my job was not exactly the most sustainable. So I'm originally from Colorado. I'm a mountain girl. I'm incredibly passionate about this beautiful planet we live on. And as a conservator, I found it very difficult to align my moral and ethical compass with my day job. And this is what instigated me to start Key Culture. So enough about me. Let's talk about the S word, sustainability. Now, this word is used a lot in a lot of different contexts. And one of the things that I've learned is that it means different things to different people in different places. When you say sustainability, some people say it's making positive change. Some people say it's being environmentally responsible. Others say it's being socially responsible. A lot of people tend to think sustainability is something that's important for the future. Well, what we're going to learn is that it's important for right now and important for our past in order to be able to be brought into the future. But what's really important, and I just want to emphasize, is that sustainability is not synonymous with climate change. Now, we're going to talk about this whole web of sustainability. But I really wanted to emphasize what it means, means for me. And when I started this journey, I thought, you know, but what I'm doing is good. Like, I'm an art conservator. That's really sustainable in the sense that SDG 11.4 literally says to conserve and protect our world's natural and cultural heritage. That's what I'm doing. So why am I still feeling like there's something going on here? And it wasn't until my friend Henry McGee gave me his definition of sustainability that it really hit me. The problem I was having was that while I was doing something really wonderful for the preservation of our cultural heritage, the way I was doing it was unsustainable. Sustainability, according to Henry, is doing good without doing harm. So I'm sure you all are familiar with the UN SDGs, the five Ps, the three pillars. Um, some people say culture is the fourth pillar. Personally, I think it's the pedestal that everything is built upon. But basically, when we're talking about sustainability, we're actually talking about a giant web of intertwined, connected concepts and themes. And what you start learning when you start delving into this pool of sustainability is that you can't talk about one thing without the other. You can't talk about the climate crisis without talking about indigenous rights. You can't talk about the burning of the Amazon without talking about COVID. Everything is interconnected, interrelated, almost like a data space. So we had this analogy on Wednesday about a ship. I also like to use an analogy, but I like to use a puzzle. I love puzzles, by the way. I, that's like one of my favorite things to do, even as a kid. And um, I, I tend to be quite good at puzzles. And so I actually decided to challenge myself and flip a puzzle upside down and do it backwards, because that's just what I think is entertaining. <laughs> but while I was doing this, I realized that it challenged me not only to you know 
be able to do something in a very weird way, but it actually had me starting to look at things differently. And I realized that this is what sustainability is. Because when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, you have a preconceived notion. You have a painted picture of what it looks like at the end of the puzzle. Sustainability, we have no idea what that picture is going to look like. And when we're putting pieces together of a puzzle, we tend to rely on colors. And we start piecing things together based on, okay, there's blue over here. This is green. But when we flip it upside down, we have to start looking at these pieces differently. So you start picking out things that make sense. It's very easy always to put the rim together or the uh, border together. And then you can start looking at shapes and start picking out patterns. And before you know it, things actually start to look like they make sense. And then you have a complete picture. Now, the picture is still blank because we still don't know exactly what sustainability is gonna be like, but that's the opportunity and that's the excitement. I don't need to convince you all that climate change is real. We know this. We know that the climate is changing. We know that we have an impact on this. We are seeing firsthand more and more frequently how this is affecting our personal lives. We're also seeing more and more frequently how this is affecting our jobs. As a conservator, it's incredibly, um, yeah, what's the word? It, it's scary, it's terrifying actually, to see how climate change is not only threatening you know, your house and home, but also our, nat our cultural heritage. And more and more, we're seeing floods, we're seeing uh, coastal erosion that's threatening built heritage. So it's really something that I, propone to my conservation friends that is no longer would be nice, but actually it is ingrained in our jobs to protect this planet. What about social justice? This is something that we've talked a little bit about during this week. While we are sitting here today in this very comfortable climate controlled room, we have our you know coffees and our badges and it's all very nice. There are 33 million people displaced in Pakistan right now. There are now over 83 people dead in Iran protesting for women's rights. We are quite privileged. And we have to recognize that and also see what we can actually do about this. Because as the cultural sector, we have a huge voice in social justice issues. And it's important that we speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Social justice doesn't just have to do with politics. It has to do with storytelling. And one of the things that we've seen a lot of in the past few years is this concept of decolonization, repatriation. Whose stories are we telling? Are we perpetuating structural racism by only telling the side of the victors? So how do we actually contribute to this large web of sustainability? Well, we have a lot of different ways, and I specified this, of course, for the digital component, because, of course, there's larger ways that we, um, that we contribute, but we're going to kind of narrow it down for a hot second here and talk about data, talk about digital, talk about technology. So there's a lot of different things that have impacts. Uh, digitizing collections, our digital footprint. You know, we started realizing during COVID all of these issues of, you know, what is the carbon footprint of a Zoom call? And actually how much energy does a email consume? Um, also, of course, NFTs. That's a popular thing these days, technology in the cultural sector. We, I, the first thing I think of is NFTs. VR and AR, we have some really cool demonstrations of that. But what is the footprint of that? What is the energy intensity of that? What is the messaging there? What is the connection to the heritage? Also, of course, what is our opportunities? So research, education, outreach, all of these wonderful things that we have the privilege to do. Building awareness, we've talked a lot about democratizing digital. That's incredibly important. Digital sovereignty, who does data belong to? One of the issues that we have though, this was supposed to pop up now, we don't really know. We don't really know what our impact is because it's in a lot of ways immeasurable. We've talked a lot about carbon footprinting. I'm gonna get into that in a little bit, but we also don't really know what our social impact is. And that's challenging because we feel like we have these incredible opportunities and this incredible responsibility, but sometimes it's immeasurable, but sometimes it doesn't need to be measurable. Sometimes it just needs to be felt. So let's switch over and talk about digital culture. And um, I have to say, as a conservator, I'm very materials focused in my training. So digital culture 
uh, was kind of a newer concept for me, but of course it's becoming more and more prevalent. It's not just about digitizing collections or putting things on the web. It's also about experiences. Um, as I said already, AR and VR are very popular right now, but also these more immersive experiences where actually there is no physical art there. There is no painting. I don't know if any of you have had the chance to see these exhibitions that are traveling around. There's a Van Gogh, there's a Monet, there's um, a few of uh, the other masters. And there are these immersive experiences where you walk into these gigantic rooms with these huge walls and you sit there and listen to music and see images of Van Gogh just painted on the walls. And it's, it's all very captivating. And um, I was telling someone yesterday, we were talking about this, that they had said that they had gone to this. And I said, you know, what for me was the most impactful part about my experience when I went to one of these events, I was in North Carolina. Um, that's a long story, we won't go there. But <laughs> I went to this, this Van Gogh, Van Gogh uh, immersive experience. And, you know, I'm privileged enough that I've seen all of these paintings in real life. And that for me is like a very deep emotional connection. But what struck me is that when I walked into this immersive space, it wasn't the actual artwork, it wasn't the experience, it was the audience. There was a gentleman sitting there watching this immersive Van Gogh experience wearing a Make America Great Again hat. And I was just like, that is really cool. It's quite amazing to think that, you know, when we look at culture today, who are we connecting with? Who comes into our museums? But technology and these new experiences have the capacity to expand our horizons and expand our audiences and connect with people who may have thought that museums weren't for them. So let's go back to the relevance of digital culture. I was chatting with Francis Morris, who is the director of Tate Modern, and we were talking about this whole rush to digitize during COVID. And she was telling me that one of the most remarkable things that they found is, of course, at Tate Modern, they're doing a huge digitization project. They have most of their collections, what, 78,000 results just for, um, you know, artworks. And then, of course, you have archive items and all of the things, thousands and thousands and thousands of things on here. And we were chatting about the relevance of this. And she said that, you know, there's a huge rush during COVID to put everything online so that people could experience it. You're putting your collections online, individual items, but you're also putting online experiences such as tours, things like that. And she said that actually the most popular part of the website was not the collections. People weren't trying to engage with art digitally. What they were doing is visiting the kids section and doing the kids activities because of course you all had your children at home that you needed to entertain. So once again, what is the value here? What is the relevance of digital? Who is using and accessing and needing to access an artwork that is living on a website? Versus what is the immersive experiences that we can offer if we think a little bit more outside the box? The other thing of course is what is our actual footprint? Um, how big is our pie piece? This is a question I get a lot of. And we've talked about this, and I'm going to mention the European Carbon uh, Report in just a second. But basically, as the cultural sector, in a lot of cases, we've kind of hidden behind this once again. But we're doing good. We're public institutions. I was at a conference in San Francisco in 2018, and I was speaking with the sustainability director at the um, municipality of New York. And he was saying that in 2004, all of the buildings in the city of New York were required to report their carbon footprints. This is called benchmarking, so that you can compare and see where you can make improvements. And it's a very important part of the whole energy efficiency carbon thing. And he said that in 2004, when this became law, the museums were exempt from this because they lobbied for it. They said, but we're for the public benefit and it's required for us to have massive amounts of energy consumption because it's important for us to preserve our collections. We can no longer hide in our high and mighty white towers and say that we are not part of the problem. We're gonna see soon Machiavelli is dead. So that was an example of um, an NFT and the carbon footprint there and I don't know how to go back. There I again. Um, this is a, a uh, article that was written about the British Museum's NFT project. You guys can read. The um, 
project emits enough carbon to power a U.S. house for 57 years, 57 houses a year. We talked about 11 houses a year. This is one museum, one NFT project. So, you know, what does this all mean? And is this something that we can still continue to say, yeah, but it's for culture? We talked about the Europeana Carbon Report. I have to say it's wonderful always to see people reporting and being transparent about it. This is the very important thing. I'll talk more about this in a little bit. And as Harry mentioned, you know, the carbon footprint of the total organization was 11 houses. The carbon footprint of the digital services was totaled to be 38.9 tons. So what does this mean? And as Harry mentioned, it's very complicated to conceptualize this. There is a fabulous tool. It's down here at the bottom. You guys can't see that because there are chairs. But it's called the GHG Emissions Calculator. I like to plug my numbers in there because it contextualizes things. As Harry mentioned, you know, it'll give you how many houses. It'll also give you how many smartphones. So 38.9 tons of carbon emissions can power almost 5 million phones. It is... 90, almost 97,000 miles driven, which is miles, sorry, it's not in kilometers. This is an American website. It's 43,000 pounds of coal burned. And it will take 643 trees to sequester that carbon. And by the way, those are trees that are growing for 10 years. This is one of the other problems with carbon offsets. Oh, I was watching a, uh, a really great article about, car or a great video from um, John Oliver about carbon offsets yesterday. Highly recommend it if you would like more information about why carbon offsets are not really a great thing. We do have solutions, though. This is the great news. All right, so what does all of this mean? As I mentioned, Machiavelli is dead. It is no longer okay for us to say that the ends justify the means. We cannot say that, oh, we're the cultural sector, we're doing wonderful things, and we're, we're not a big piece of the pie, so it's really okay for us to you know, not really think about our carbon emissions or not really think about the social impact of what we're doing. We are not neutral. We can't sit here and say that we don't have a responsibility, that we don't have a part to play in this. So what is our opportunity? Well, that's the great news. And I promise now we're going to get really, um, you know, peppy and excited about things. <laughs> that part was a little bit depressing, but now we're going to get into the good stuff. We know that culture can connect people. We know that art, history, stories, performances have a way to incite emotional drive within people. So what if we change our narrative? What if we're not just about the aesthetics or about the history, but what if we're about connecting our past with our present? What if we're about connecting our present with our future? And what about if we're connecting not only with the artwork, but with each other? All right. One of the issues that we're facing right now, of course, is that there are a lot of other things going on in the world. It's not just about digital cultural heritage. It's not just about cultural heritage. It's not just about culture. And as all of these kind of disasters and issues are bubbling up and culminating at the same time, we're going to see something very scary happen, which is the fact that we are not as relevant as we used to be. As these climate disaster relief, war, refugee aid, pandemics, all of these things keep raining down upon us, our role, our relevance becomes smaller and smaller. And this is really scary because also it means that we don't have as much funding. And if we don't have funding, we can't be socially sustainable and environmentally sustainable because we won't exist. So what is the future of cultural heritage? What is the future of digital cultural heritage? Two words. It's relevant and it's sustainable. So how do we do this? All right. We can start by looking at where we can have impact. Now, I think that we know this, um, but I'm going to say it anyway because that is my job, is to say things that sometimes get left unsaid. <laughs> so we're going to be looking at contemporary issues. This is about, once again, connecting our past with our present. We need to be thinking about serving our audiences and communities. We are no longer a space of monologue where we can just tell people the stories that we think is important to tell. We need to be creating this, these spaces of dialogue, not monologue. We need to think about what other people care about. 
This is no longer what we care about or what we find interesting. This is about what is what does society care about at large? What do our audiences care about? What do our communities care about? It is important for us to lead by example. We do have to be sustainable ourselves. As some of the last institutions of trust and learning and knowledge in this planet, it is incredibly important for us to maintain that. Because if we don't, then all of a sudden people won't listen to the stories we have to say. So in order to maintain the trust, we have to be transparent, we have to be sustainable, we have to lead by example. It's also important for us to create safe, trusted spaces. Historically, museums and culture were for basically the elite. So how do we open this up? How do we make not just inclusive spaces, but spaces of belonging? There's a uh, professor, Dr. Powell, at the U UC Berkeley who talks about this in the most beautiful way. And I'll, I, sometimes I show the video, but I didn't want to get too techie today. <laughs> Ironic, right? <laughs> um, and he talks about inclusion versus belonging. And I found this incredibly powerful. And he says, you know, include, there's exclusion. And he uses the party analogy. So we're going to do another analogy now. So he says, you're throwing a party. And by excluding people, you are not inviting to them the party. I'm sorry, this is my party. You can't come. That's exclusion, right? Inclusion is inviting people to the party. Hi, I'm having a party. I'd love for you to come. That's great. I would love to be there. That's including. You're inviting people in. But belonging is a step further. Belonging is saying, hey, I'm having a party. Would you also like to co-host with me? What theme should we do? It's co-creation. And that is what we need to be focusing on. It's not about inviting people in who haven't been there before. It's about creating relative, relevant spaces for people to feel that they belong there. So this is another question, of course, is that you know, we, we have these spaces, we have this culture, we have these stories to tell. So what exactly are our societal narratives? And we've been talking a little bit in the steering committee for the climate community about activism versus action. And I just want to give an antidote because I think this is a brilliant idea. Um, we talked a little bit about the whole idea, you know, there's activists right now that are gluing their hands to the frames. And okay, yeah, I'm not going to go glue my hands to a frames. But as a conservator, what I can do is I can call them and say, hey, would you guys mind using Paraloid B72 because it's reversible, right? So we totally have a way that we can, you know, support activists, even if we're not going to be doing those things. Anyway, that's if you want to. But as I said, what's really important here is to question whose stories are we telling? What stories are we telling? Are we telling history from all sides or are we just telling it from one perspective? I always like to think a colleague of mine was talking about um, a museum that he works at in Norway where, you know, it's a Viking museum and the little kids go in and they see all of the, you know, oh, the strong, amazing Vikings and they won this battle and they won this war and isn't this exciting? And you go into the gift shop and you buy your, you know, wooden sword and you leave thinking like, wow, I'm going to be a Viking. What about all of the people that were murdered, raped, pillaged, houses burned down, communities torn apart. It's glorifying violence. So whose stories are we telling? Where do our collections come from? Are we being transparent about that? There's a lot of colonial history in our museums, and that's OK, but we need to own it. We need to be transparent about it so that we can learn from history, so that we don't repeat our mistakes. This is our role and responsibility. It's also really important for us to think about who gets to experience our collections. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in relevance to the uh, data spaces in just a few minutes. And you know, we have to also think a little bit about what our relationships are with the communities where these objects came from. So are we telling histories from our perspective? Are we telling histories from their perspective using our voices? Or are we creating those spaces of belonging? All right, relevance of cultural heritage. We're going to talk about technology for just a hot second here because that was what I was asked to talk about. So I'm going to try. <laughs> so one of the things that I think is really important for us is to realize that we are changing. Technology is a great way to change. It is a really exciting way for us to become more relevant, to expand our horizons, to expand our narratives, our capacities for storytelling, to better preserve our collections. Um, you know, we, we talked about this already this week. But it's also really important for us to think about how we can advance in this way and also maintain our own 
values. So how do we use technology to maintain our values and still fulfill our mission? Why, we, we have to ask ourselves some questions, right? Why are we integrating technology? What's the environmental impact, of course? What is the social impact, of course? And then what I always like to say is there are four major questions for anything that we do within the cultural sector and actually as just individuals, as human beings, and a species. I always like to say, whenever we do something, let's take a step back and ask ourselves, what are we doing? How are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And who are we doing this for? So when we're looking at technology in the cultural sector, obviously, I'm going to sit here and tell you, it needs to be sustainable. So what does that mean? This is what I got. This is for us to fill in together. Now, I have some suggestions. I have some leading paths. But we're going back to the puzzle right now. What does sustainable cultural, digital cultural heritage look like? What is technology's role in this? How do we shape this? Well, we've got an upside down puzzle right now. So it's for us to put these pieces together. I do want to point out just a few areas that I think are important for us to emphasize. Accessibility is a big one when it comes to digital. We need to look at who is benefiting from this. One of the issues that we have in the whole digital world is that not everyone has access to internet. Not everyone has access to computers and smartphones. We, of course, are very privileged. We are just don't even think about things like that. Um, we have a program on, at Key Culture called Key Futures where we provide coaching and training for cultural institutions. And we work with a bunch of museums in Nigeria. But when we were first creating this collaboration, I was speaking with the general director, and he said, yeah, this is great, but this is all online? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, um, how, like, are you buying us laptops and buying us airtime? And I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Um, of course, you guys don't, like, not everyone at the museum has their own laptop. Not everyone at the museum has access to the internet. So how are we going to be able to make sure that this is accessible? Who's using this? And also, what capacities do our audience have? This was another thing that was I didn't really think about, but you need technical skills in order to access technology. And a lot of people are not trained, don't feel comfortable using technology. Um, there was, uh, there's a big section in one of our key books on social sustainability about digital accessibility, and it talks specifically about um, elderly audiences. And you know, there's just a, a discomfort level when it comes to data and technology and you know, all of this stuff that's new and shiny and scary. And so once again, we're narrowing our audience unless we're also being proactive in making digital and data accessible for all. The other issues that I think are really important is um, something that I, I read in an article the other day about digital overload. And I mean, we all experienced this during COVID, like this Zoom fatigue, and all of a sudden there was just this overload of webinars and available content. And I, I went out and bought uh, those computer glasses, the Blue Shield ones. I have to say it's been amazing for my headaches. <laughs> but I'm in front of the computer 16 hours a day. That's not super healthy. So. When I go to a museum, do I really want to be looking at more screens? Also, what is the relevance of cultural heritage in terms of moving away from those physical objects and moving towards the digital objects? Is it still authentic? So why do we put things online? And once again, going back to the data space, how is this data being used? It's not just the digital collections, but the actual data, all of the metadata, all of that stuff that I don't understand that lives behind the computer screen and somewhere in hyperspace. Who's accessing that? And what's the value of it? And what is the use of it? And I think that this is the really exciting opportunity for us to co-create and find out. But one of the things we need to realize is that technology is currently, today, it is not accessible. So how can we change that narrative? How can we make it accessible? How can we make it relevant? How can we make it sustainable? I promised I would talk about the carbon footprint, so I just thought I'd throw that in here because we were talking about pros and cons. And I just wanted to make sure that we are all on the same page here because when we're talking about carbon footprint, that is a very hot topic right now. Everyone's rushing to get out and measure their carbon footprint. But what we really need to think about is why are we measuring our carbon footprint? What's the purpose of that? Well, carbon footprinting is a tool. 
it's a way for us to understand better where we can make improvements. That is not the end game. It's really important for us to realize that carbon footprints are not for us and it's not just collecting data. It's about sharing the data. It's about being transparent. It's about owning what our footprint is and making sure we're communicating about it so that we can continue to have that level of trust. It's very important for us to realize that the footprint is not the end game. And this is why we have to make sure we don't get lost in it because carbon footprinting could be this gigantic black hole that you get sucked into and never get out of. So I would like to just recommend to everyone, definitely measure what you don't know. Don't spend time measuring what you do know. Museums know that their audience, scope three, is their largest footprint. Does it really make sense for us to spend all of this time and energy and money to measure the carbon footprint of every single visitor that comes into our door? No. I think that money and that time and that those resources, that energy, would be better spent thinking about what we can do to solve it. So carbon footprinting is a tool. It is not the end game. So valuable when we need it, but also think about why we're doing it. All right. Sustainable digital heritage. These are just some ideas that I thought of. This is not necessarily where we're at, but maybe where we want to be going. So what does sustainable digital heritage look like? Well, it's accessible. We already know that currently it's not accessible, so this is something we need to work on. It's also environmentally considerate. We talked about mitigating the data space. All right, what does that look like? Um, how can we make sure that we are being considerate of the environment and buying into natural ecosystems rather than building more data centers on top of ecosystems? It's open. We already know that Europeana is open, so that's wonderful. We've ticked that box. That's nice. But we need to make sure that it continues to be open and that also, what does open actually mean? This goes back to the inclusion versus belonging conversation. It's for everyone. Right now, it's not. As we know, it's not accessible. A lot of people don't have access to this. So how do we make it for everyone? It's effective and it's efficient. Um, I will let you guys interpret this as you will. I have opinions about this, but that for me is what sustainability means in a lot of senses. It's effective and it's efficient. And it connects people. And I know that this is the mission. This is the whole idea behind this data space is to connect people, to make bring data out of the data sphere and into real life impact. This is the power of what we can do. All right, so what we have to do now is ask some of the tough questions. One thing I'd like to know, is Europeana only for Europe? What is our role in storytelling? Whose stories are being told? We talked about this a little bit already, but what is our role? What is Europeana's role? What is our individual role as cultural professionals? How are we gonna mitigate the carbon footprint? We talked about the fact that that's something that we'd like to do, but how are we actually going to do that? Watch that carbon offset video. It's really amazing. I could, I could give you a whole nother lecture about carbon offsets. I like to do insets. We're just gonna leave it at that. That's where you invest in reducing your own carbon footprint in the first place rather than putting money into projects that usually don't actually sequester the carbon. But John can tell you more about that. And once again, I have this question, and I mentioned this on, on uh, Wednesday in my provocation. Why does this matter? Who cares about this? Like, why are we doing it? Who's using it? And the fundamental question, of course, is that we want to be able to connect people. So how does technology connect people? I mean, when you go into the train now, you look around and everyone's just sitting there on their phones. So is technology not disconnecting us? What does heritage do? And what does it mean today? A lot of people find museums to be boring or irrelevant. But we know that that's not true. We know museums are awesome. We know collections are amazing. We know that our past is the key to our future. So how can we make sure we're better communicating that? And then, of course, as we know, we're collecting all this data. We're collecting all of this information. What are we doing with it? All right. So I wanted to talk about, I, I know that Mike asked me to put milestones. I'm going to talk about more opportunities here because I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to kind of provoke some thoughts and uh, invite opportunities for us. So one of the things that I loved about what Harry said with in terms of the vision for the data space is translating that data into real life experiences and community support. 
that to me is sustainability in a nutshell. So I am so excited to see how that comes to fruition. Using data to connect people. As I said, technology can connect us, but it can also separate us. So how can we use this data space? How do we use data? How do we use technology to actually connect people rather than just saying that, you know, oh, it's you, you have your social media platforms? Because that doesn't really connect people. In a lot of ways, that divides people more than anything. Well, I think that one of the big things we need here is better awareness. And I think that it's important that we really focus on our voices. One of the three main bottlenecks I find for inhibiting sustainability is poor communication. I always like to talk about this term popping bubbles. We know that one of the issues we have with achieving sustainability is that we're working in silos. We are working in silos not only geographically or by language or by sector or by field, but also sometimes by department. It's shocking to me when I go into big institutions how the conservators have never talked to the facilities managers. And consequently, they have not had the conversation about their climate control. There was a museum that I work with that um, opened uh, six years. Well, this was back in the day. So they had been open for six years. And they finally put in a temporary exhibition. And the um, head conservator and the facilities manager were sitting in the in the temporary exhibition talking about the climate control and the head conservator said yes this needs to be 19 plus or minus two it was a waterlogged wood exhibition so all right and the facilities manager looked and said plus or minus two and she said yes 19 plus or minus two please and he said well why can this space be plus or minus two and that space has to be 19 set point and she looked at me, she's like, it doesn't have to be 19 set point. That can be plus or minus two. And he goes, we've been running it at set point for the last six years. They changed it to the range and saved 60, 60 percent on their energy bill. We need to pop those bubbles. We need to start talking. As I mentioned earlier, technology appeals to new audiences. This is really cool. Let's harness this. Let's run with it. Let's see how we can get everyone to feel that they belong to the cultural sector. The other thing that I'm personally really excited about and have been exploring with some colleagues of mine is that technology offers an opportunity for new financial models. As I mentioned earlier, it's very, very challenging to be socially sustainable and environmentally sustainable if you're not economically sustainable. When I talk to museums and cultural institutions about their sustainability, the first thing they say is we can't afford it. Now, that's a little bit of bad marketing on sustainability's part because sustainability is always more financially incentiv incentivizing. But the problem is, is that sometimes it takes investment. If you want to switch out your HVAC system, that costs money. If you want to offer fair, livable wages for your staff, that costs money. So I'm really excited to explore this nexus of technology and art in terms of how can we actually look at being more financially independent all right, so I'd like to bring up some challenges. We said milestones, I'm going with challenges. So what do we do? Well, it's very important for us to look at long-term impacts. We have to stop thinking about how are we gonna get through this next month or how are we gonna get through this next quarter? How are we gonna get through this next year? It's about what is our impact not only today, not only on tomorrow, but in 100 years. We have to stop short-term thinking. We have to stop tunnel vision. What's the point of having all of this and doing all of this if we don't exist? We're at the brink of this. We have eight years left as a, as a species to figure our stuff out. So we need to make sure that we're not only thinking about what our jobs are today, but what we're gonna be looking like in the next five years, in the next eight years, in the next 10 years. The other thing, of course, and I've said this over and over again, but repetition is key, and I think that these are very important points. We're communicating a larger message here. It's not just about data. It's not about cultural heritage. It's about our species. It's about our planet. It's about integrating ourselves as humans back into nature. So how do we use technology to do that? It's also important for us to know that it's OK to not know all the answers right now. As I said, I'm not here to give you the answers. I'm here to ask the questions. And we're going to co-create those answers together. We've got a puzzle. It's flipped upside down. We're going to have to work together to figure out how to piece it together. And of course, it's really important for us to think about how we can positively contribute. Going back to Harry's statement about doing good without doing harm, well, how can we do good and do good? So that web of sustainability 
it's something that we need to be adding to as opposed to taking from. And I also think it's really important for us to realize that we're not doing our jobs just because it's cool. We're not integrating technology into art and culture just because it's cool. We're not looking at creating this data space just because we can or because it's cool. There is purpose to this, and that's what sustainability is. It's purpose. All right, you did say milestones, and I did say milestones. All right, where do we go from here? So I've got, oh, I'm already a minute over, so I'm gonna try and go through this very quickly. Sorry, I tend to talk a lot. <laughs> Start with the tough questions. We've started looking at those. Educate ourselves. Learn about what sustainability is. Learn about what the purpose of your, your jobs are, connected to sustainability. I found it really interesting that there was a mention about correlating between recycling and culture, but guys, recycling is not the answer. That is the very last and most unsustainable circle in circular economy. Educate yourself. So if you don't know what circular economy is, come talk to me. I'll give you a whole lecture about it. The 1% problem. This is a huge opportunity for us. The people who are causing the most damage to this planet are also the people that we connect with the most. They're the people that are coming to our institutions. They're the people who have access to the technologies and the data that we're looking at doing. Let's make a big difference with those people. We need to look outside Europeana. We need to look outside Europe. We need to start popping those bubbles. We need to start co-creating. We need to start not only inviting people, but being open for this belonging that is actually the future of culture. We need to keep our goals in mind. Same things with what we were talking about with the carbon footprinting. What is the purpose of this? Don't get stuck in black holes. We need to really think about what our impact is and what our educational opportunities are, not only for ourselves, but for our audience. I told you already, Machiavelli died. He's gone. Ends no longer justify the means. We have to think about how every single thing that we do impacts this larger web of sustainability. And of course, as we talked about earlier on Wednesday, the triple transition. We are going to be doing this together. This is not a situation where technology is ahead of the game and culture comes up behind it. We need to be also in line with that race. And I think the most important thing that I can emphasize is collaborations and partnerships. And Harry said this very eloquently. The future is in collaboration, and that's what we need to be focusing on. All right, I'm going to wrap up here because I know I'm running over. Um, but I just want to emphasize that every single person has a role to play in this. And you can already start doing a lot today just by being mindful, by thinking about what you're doing, asking those four questions. Why am I doing this? How am I doing it? Could I do it better? Why am, who am I doing this for? Ask yourself, be mindful. These questions are the first steps to finding solutions. So it's important to speak up. Your agency is your mouth, use it. Very important for us to apply these big, beautiful brains of ours. Don't do things just because that's the way it's already been, always been done. Challenge the status quo. Use critical thinking skills. We, I think it's so impressive. This cultural sector of ours has this unique perspective on society. We have the problem-solving skills that we need to solve some of these biggest issues. We just need to use our brains to do it. Sometimes that's a little bit scary, but we need to do that. Educate yourself. I've said it before. I'll say it again. And then, of course, asking ourselves these four important questions. All right. I mentioned collaborations and partnerships. I talked about the fact that you guys don't have to have all the answers. I don't have time to go through the tools and resources, but if you want to know about any of those, please do let me know. I'm just going to squeeze through those. Oh, there we go. The important thing to know here, guys, is that the future is sustainable. There literally is no other future if it's not sustainable. So this is where we have the impact. Let's ask ourselves these questions. Let's use our voices. And let's become leaders for this transition, because otherwise we're going to have culture get left behind. Thank you.